Hello, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to yet another very exciting episode of the Friends Talking Fantasy Podcast. My name is Charles, and not with me today as he normally is, is my lifelong friend and co-host Dylan. Instead, I have the pleasure of introducing his debut in front of the microphone. We have Joel. Joel, welcome to the show. Thank you. It is uh, quite an honor to be here. I'm excited <laughs> to get down and talk about stuff. Yeah, we're. Ex- I mean, I'm super excited to have you on. I, Joel has been a part of FTF for a while now. We've been working on the background, behind the scenes, he uh, to get our YouTube channel up and running. We've got some very exciting plans for that coming up, and Joel is spearheading that whole thing, so we're super thrilled to have him involved in that. And uh, a little bit of a movie background for you as well, right? Yeah, actually, uh, I just got my master's uh, at the very beginning of the pandemic. Uh, I graduated for film and television production down in Full Sail in Orlando. So I, without sounding, you know, too pretentious, I would definitely (laughs) say... uh, The topic for today is something I definitely focus on. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly right. And that's why I'm so thrilled to have you on today. There's a couple of reasons, obviously. One, to introduce you to everybody because you've been working hard for us behind the scenes. So happy to have your voice on the show. Two, we're going to be talking about a movie today. And it's a movie that we actually saw together in theaters not that long ago. This was my like return to the movie theater, basically. Um, So, yeah, that's a good movie to come back to. It's a, it's very cinematic, and we'll get into that. And then, obviously, your movie background is going to be very insightful as we go into the discussion here. So, yes, by the title, you guys could tell, we are going to be talking about The Green Knight. This is a movie that is in theaters now at the time of this recording. It's by uh, A24, which makes all kinds of, like, artsy movies. And art house films. Art house films film's exactly right and you know joel and i saw this together just a few weeks ago and i've been i think digesting it ever since trying to understand it but uh (laughs) we're gonna get into that we'll do a spoiler free kickoff just initial reactions and then we'll get a little bit into the weeds with the story uh after that so yeah i mean i remember joel walking out of that theater and being like i'm not sure what i just saw but i liked it (laughs) Mm mm-hmm yeah, no, uh, A24 films sometimes have that effect, I've found, and I, I really appreciate, uh, it, it, if you are going in, and I would say the uh, ads and trailers for the movie very much played it like, this is going to be your typical narrative blockbuster experience, mm-hmm. and the actual product is very much a meditative journey that the film kind of invites you to partake in along with the protagonist. And so there's definitely a moment, even for me, where I'm walking out kind of almost shell-shocked with awe about what I just saw. So I get it. (laughs) Yeah, for me, it was very surprising. I thought going into it, too, I was like, first of all, no one's talking about this. And that just may be like the cinema's going through some times right now, not really in the popular vernacular like it used to be but even still i was like this is a fantasy movie you know swords and sorcery kind of thing from the trailer Mm. a24 which i always found to make like beautiful looking movies um and we can go through some maybe some of the movies that they've made a little later on but they've made like didn't they do midsummer and the witch and all that they did uh, another one that was more recent, but also on the I would argue the same level of art house film would be the Lighthouse that had Robert yes. Pattinson and Willem Dafoe. Yes, I saw that so. too. That was an interesting one as well. So yeah, they have like a lot of just what I like about A twenty four is that usually when I see their movies, they're like they're not trying to just make the next blockbuster. They're just trying to make like a unique like put a lot of thought behind the cinematography of a movie and they are making a movie like art house for sure. They're very focused on um, like there's two sides, obviously there's still a movie studio. Uh, They they're there to make money, but uh, unlike some of the bigger budget places, they don't do 
as big a budget for their movies typically. They they put out more artsy stuff that has a chance at, you know, a shot at greatness and mo- cinematic history, but at the same time, uh, they go in understanding not every single thing they make is going to be hits, but mm-hmm. they, through how they manage their budgets on a lower operative scale, it allows them to be a lot more creative and risk-taking. Mm. And when I saw they were doing a fantasy piece, I well, I was very conscious going into the movie too. I'm like, fantasy is traditionally so expensive to make. Or mm. Otherwise, it just looks bad. But you could tell that they were doing it on a budget, but everything was still high quality, right? It's like, okay. Yeah. Like, our main character is just going to walk around in the woods for a while. He looks great, and he's in the woods, which he just looks, looks like great. the woods. <laughs> the woods look great. Yeah. You've got... Uh, brilliant cinematography the lighting's there everything seems to be working out and that's like one of the things i really liked about this film actually Mm. it was they were very conscious of okay we have you know this amount of money that's not going to stop us from telling our story in as beautiful a way as possible and they really did nail that i think it was Mm. yeah no we don't need a huge roster of background actors. We mm-hmm. we just want to tell the story itself, get straight to yeah. the point and do it. And yeah, we don't because need these of that. Curious- period piece costumes we don't need large epic battles we don't exactly. need all these special effects we don't need explosions we yeah. don't need constant cgi in the right. background mm-hmm. because this story doesn't require that right so they they put they put all of their budget where it needed to be so effectively turn yeah. which is such an underrated thing oh, yeah. in appreciating a film like this this is a solid piece of cinema yeah. made on, uh, and it's because of how smart they were with their budget. Right. And my takeaway from this movie was exactly that. I was like, what a gorgeous, what a gorgeous movie. And yeah, I just love looking at swords and sorcery type stuff. So mm-hmm. like the whole time, I the story is very like cerebral and loose and not non-existent for it's a large part of the time. Almost, Surreal yeah. sometimes. Absolutely. And goes in so many different directions, and you're like, okay, I don't fully understand what's happening. I don't think I'm supposed to, but I'm I'm enjoying it. And I know that that can be like a turnoff for a lot of moviegoers. Is like stuff needs to be happening. I this I know I want to follow the story. I want I'm looking for the action. This, Especially that, if you were like watching a trailer, right? Mm. That uh, they have put out that like if you go in at never having seen a film like this before, mm. but you saw a trailer that seemed to promise you one thing, I can definitely get how some <laughs> people might walk out going. What was the point of this? <laughs> oh yeah, like I could, I know some friends. If I took that too, they'd be mad at me because they'd be like, "This is so <laughs> boring, dude. Why did you take me to this?" But it's like, come on, like, did you see how like cool it looked and the shot they did and how it like looked different from this mm. and and like all that, all that interesting, all the interesting bits of it that you walk away with. Then that like comes to my main criticism, which mm. is like the the. St- story in which it's based on i found to be really loose and a bit too up in the air you know i think the um the director for this movie david lowry who you know directed a movie i watched called like a ghost story which is all i need to know about the guy that movie was like (laughs) oh my god have you seen that movie joel i have not oh man there's just like a 10 minute scene of a woman on the floor eating a pie for 10 minutes mm-hmm. nothing else happens and she eats the whole thing it's crazy but uh, it's just like one of those really slow doesn't matter what's happening like you just keep watching for some reason you're compelled to keep watching kind of a movie like this one is mm-hmm. so that for me and then the whole premise which will like the whole premise of the movie is the green knight crashes you know uh, king arthur's round table and and says, oh, whoever inflicts a wound on me, I get to inflict a wound on them next year. And it's like, that's the premise. You chop the Green Knight's head off, and then he gets to chop your head off, and now you're going to go on a journey to get your head chopped off? Like, that part to me never really stuck. But it is the basis of, like, the the original King Arthur, like, Folk I mean, tale. It, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is considered like one of the highest pieces of old English literature, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's one of the mainstays of Arthurian legend, too. And it 
I mean, I just reread the uh, modern uh, retelling of it, and it, it's still very much... It's trying to be as faithful as it can while also being, you know, legible to right. someone who reads modern English. Right. And it's not that long a story. It it pretty much does, like, that's that's the main... It, if manuscripts back in the day had a little uh, backside of the scroll like a book, right. that's essentially what it would be. That's, that's your plot right there. Right. And um, at the same time, though... I thought it had uh, a lot of subtlety added to it. Um, th- there was a lot of changes to yes, it. Yes, a um, lot of changes. A lot of liberties, mm-hmm. but the core root of uh, events really, right. I would say, uh, tied everything together in such a strong way. But I do want to point out, because mm-hmm. a friend pointed this out to me, and I think it is very interesting, and I just... I, I got to say it before I forget. Yeah, let's um, hear it. So they had pointed out in this entire movie, there are, and I'm just going to pull it up just to make sure I'm quoting them correctly. All right, getting the uh, sources. Yeah, so <laughs> uh, they are hex what on Twitter, H-E-X-X what on Twitter. Okay. And um, it's... We only get the names of three characters. Everyone else is referred... Like, King Arthur is never called King Arthur. It's my no, king, it's the yeah. king, the high king, mm-hmm. uh, lord, lady, mother. That's that's all you get. Mm-hmm. In, we get uh, three named characters. We get Gawain. Mm-hmm. We have Essel, uh, which was is his love interest in the very beginning of the film. Right. And Winifred, Saint Winifred, which is also another uh, character from myth and legend, but also is actually a saint. Okay. Um, she's based on another tale legend from back then. There's a scene where she shows up, and uh, basically we get a very condensed retelling of her myth as well. Uh, it's the uh, ghost story, essentially, that happens in the middle of the oh, movie. Oh, right, right. The younger woman with the missing mm-hmm. head. Gotcha. Yes. Gotcha. Which I think was a wonderful performance played by... Um, oh, no. Now I'm forgetting names again. <laughs> uh, she she was recently uh, the antagonist in Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Uh, oh, if you watch the that. Han Solo movie, uh, she was the... All of a sudden, reveal at the end the twist. She wasn't the bad guy. She was actually like trying to start the rebellion. Oh, interesting. But yeah, she she did a wonderful performance because she does show up again. They, I wouldn't say it's a reuse of actors. It's a like trying to make note of certain events that happen. So oh, yeah. I yeah. just thought that was interesting. Um, but yeah, no, there there was a really poignant explanation or no hang on sorry i'm gonna reword this there was a really good point where it's we only get these three characters names and of these three characters there is an expectation put on gawain throughout this entire film every character has essentially the same expectation for him of greatness you're going to become a knight you are going to become uh, anyone who's familiar with Sir Gawain in Arthurian legend, like the purest, noblest, most chivalrous knight Mm -hmm. of the round table. uh, And everyone expects that of him. The only people who don't really put that expectation on him is uh, himself, Essel, and St. Winifred. Mm St. Winifred, because frankly, it's a ghost story. She has no skin in the game for (laughs) his overall narrative arc. Uh, Essel is someone who actively, in Gawain's mind, is keeping him back from attaining greathood. Mm -hmm. And then there's Gawain, who is just riddled with his self-doubt. So I just thought that was interesting. This is truly... And it's funny, too, because we're missing the first part of the name of this story. This is just called The Green Knight. It's not Sir Gawain and The Green Knight like the original text is. So it's it's really putting this emphasis on 
he is not Sir Gawain yet, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's true. And, like, it took me a while after watching the film to unpack, like, what really was the themes and the symbolism in this movie. And certainly Mm -hmm. chivalry is one of them. And then this idea of, like, him learning to be not not so guarded or i guess like you know where he wears the the green sash like his like holding on to mm-hmm. uh you know his like being protected being guarded and versus accepting like these greater things about himself so i was a hundred percent i was digesting those quite a bit and i think that's one of the biggest takeaways from this movie is and this is kind of where I want to wrap up the spoiler free section is mm. kind of like what I recommend this movie. Who's this movie for? I would hesitantly recommend it. And I only say hesitantly because it is a very like dry artsy movie, probably drier and artsier than someone would expect going in based off the trailers and the fact yeah. that it's in movie theaters, big blockbuster thing release and things like that. So that's the only hesitation I have. But if you're someone who like loves movies for the sake of movies, movie as an art form, art house movies, you definitely got to go see it for sure. And that's I will I also up. chime in. Yeah. Uh, even if you're not a fan of those, if you're a big fan of Dev Patel, oh, this movie yeah. is for you. There is... There's a lot of eye candy about Dev Patel in there. And I'll just put fantastic. that out. Fantastic! His performance oh. is so so good as uh, Gawain. Ga- Gawain. Gawain is that what we're calling? That's uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> basically, <laughs> that's and, kind of the running joke. No character ever uh, pronounces his name the same way. Right. Right. And yeah, that's that's true. It, it's he's does a brilliant job. All the actors do a really good job in this movie uh, for mm-hmm. sure. But him especially, and the mo- he is like ninety percent of the movie anyway. So oh, yeah. the fact that he just rocks the role is, and like you said, absolute eye candy as well. And there's some meat in the bones with acting chops perspective. <laughs> so yeah, highly recommend for that reason as well. That's a great point. So with that being said, let's get a little bit deeper into some of the like finer details of the green knight here we're gonna get into spoilers i would say i don't know if this movie can really be spoiled so if you're still interested you can hang around but we are not gonna hold back on any of the plot points that that happen in this movie from here on out so if you don't want any plot points spoiled for you turn this down in your headphones now man it's usually what dylan says it feels weird uh, to, to say it myself but that's where we are so yeah, here we are. The Green Knights. You know, I love the look of the Green Knight, by the way. I was very oh. I was all in on this movie in the up to like this beginning mm-hmm. segment was fantastic. Um and the Green Knight himself looked incredible. I mean, just like truly they they knew what they were doing with their budget. But yeah, I was gonna Again, say that's where just the to go was. back, yeah. but like <laughs> the it, it wasn't just his look either. Uh, the sound design for the Green Knight, not just his voice being this warbly, ethereal, uh, bassy voice. You also had all of his movements. If you're like paying attention, you'll notice it's like hearing the sound in the middle of a forest on a windy day and the trees move. Every time he moved, you heard the creaking of like a tree or when he like goes to swing his axe, there's it. It. Yeah. really does sound like a tree is falling it was a, a great forest. cinematic experience i'll say going mm. back to the movies this was like the second movie i've seen in the past like 16 <laughs> months so it's been, a, it's been a minute it's been a minute so the so to be back in the theater and to see something like that where like you're describing it on the wide screen get to appreciate all the you know on location shots and get to hearing the crunching of the leaves swinging of the armor and like riding the horses it's yeah it's all there and this movie moves at a very you know the scenes normally are moving at a pretty slow pace Mm -hmm. so you just get to like take it all in and there's a lot to take in 
and yeah, I, I, I thought it was fantastic. And that Green Knight right away, man, like you said, that's where all oh. the money went <laughs> in terms for special effects is making is and making the Green Knight uh, shine. And yeah. the voice of the Green Knight was super cool. Um, it was so it was so interesting to me because yeah. I've read uh, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight way way back in either middle school or high school. Mm-hmm. I read it uh, in college and then uh, in my bachelor's, and then I just recently re- read another version of it right before going to see it in theaters. And the the most fascinating thing to me is how they portrayed the Green Knight. Mm-hmm. Because a lot of the texts, it's essentially he is a giant hulking figure, taller than any man, but he's he's a man. He he's a dude, and usually it it varies from uh, like pulling from Celtic and Welsh folklore, and like he's this giant uh, person, creature, fey folk. But there are all, there's also a lot of, like, hints that uh, linking him to the devil, mm-hmm. where it's he rides off to a shower of sparks and a howling laughter yeah. that, inci- <laughs> that incenses all the dogs. And it's, you know, it's, it's a lot of uh, descriptive poetry, essentially, trying to make you go, oh, this is a bad guy. And uh, in this one, it was very much more... Um, This is, they, they went and Green Knight in the old Mm -hmm. text, because he was oddly clad in all green. He had, and he also had green hair, green beard sometimes. And, but that was it. It was still a human looking person. And this one, they were just like, no, he is an avatar of the earth of, of trees and growth, which was, personally like that's how i always viewed it in my head anyways so i was just really happy to see that right no i agree and you could tell that there was a lot of consideration of the source material but then very Mm. deliberate changes it it was an interesting kind of compromise i thought where when you read more about the story of sir gawain and the green knight and like how that story goes and then what we get in this movie they're quite different like this movie very purposefully is called the green knight there's no sir Gawain because he's not a knight in the beginning of this movie yeah. and learning about what chivalry is and what it means is kind of the whole point of this movie and yeah. by treating the green sash differently and by treating the end of this movie differently i think it does bring home that meaning of chivalry in a much more clear way in a much stronger way at least in terms of like modern storytelling and i thought it was all for the better i don't think it needed to sure. to be a one for one commitment to this original story that we have that may not even be accurate anyway it's the story so old and translated <laughs> yeah. a thousand times actually before before we go forward can i just yeah. give a brief like uh cover of the original story let's hear so it, we yeah. have a little bit of framework to work off of so Brilliant. the idea usually the way the story is told is sir sir gawain is already sir gawain he's mm-hmm. already king arthur's right hand man usually this is told from a more french perspective where gawain is or king arthur is a little bit less of a hero he's older and now he sends out his knights to do things rather than doing things himself mm-hmm. uh Green Knight shows up, does this whole contest thing, off he goes, uh, Sir Gawain chops off his head, Green Knight says, cool, find me at this uh, Green Chapel in a year, I'm going to do whatever you did to me, essentially. Mm. And at that, uh, it just kind of jumps forward, says Sir Gawain made the most of his life with kind of the thought of death hanging over him the whole time. Right. And then eventually, somewhere after summer, he starts on his quest to find the Green Knight. And it's wild, because a lot of these stories, and the way a manus- the manuscript that a lot of these uh, retellings are based off of, it basically just goes, so he went on a lot of adventures during this time, but that's too much to really talk about right now, so I right. won't. Right. And it, it then immediately jumps to 
like the Christmas before he's supposed to meet this knight and he comes across this castle, meets this lord and lady who just treat him with kindness and he basically goes through three tests of chivalry of not to sleep with this lord's uh, wife uh, while he's out hunting for three uh, every three days. Right. And an exchange is made. Now, this is where the interpretation came in. Uh, in chivalry, in tales of chivalry back then, a very common thing, you might al- also make a connection to modern day like France right. or European, it's uh, a kiss on the cheek. It's a greeting. Mm-hmm. And so one of the things that happens in this tale is basically she keeps trying to essentially throw herself at him and he keep and she keeps kissing him or uh, coercing him into giving her a kiss. And every time he comes back, he they made a promise that whatever he gets from the forest, he gives to Gawain and whatever Gawain gets while he's resting there, he gives to the Lord. Mm-hmm. So every time he returns to the Lord, the kisses from his wife. <laughs> and yeah. at the end of this, he goes off, uh, it's the final day, and he just leaves uh, fully rested and meets the Green Knight, and it's a reveal that the Green Knight is actually the Lord. And right. the lady usually is Morgan Le Fay, actually. Mm-hmm. And it's a test of the most chivalrous knight to see if he's the most, if he is what he says he is. Right. And uh, because he stayed true... And the only thing he didn't return on the third day was a sash that the lady gave him to protect him. Right. And he's, he nicks his neck. He nicks Sir Gawain on the back of the neck with his axe and says, that's your punishment. That was the one point where you failed. Gawain returns home wearing the sash, not as a sash, but as uh, kind of wrapped around his arm mm-hmm. as a way of like, uh, because he is so humble... This is my shame. I must carry this to the end of my days. Right. And uh, essentially everyone in the kingdom loves him for it because he is unafraid of displaying his weakness. Right. And this story follows those beats, but changes a lot of the narrative. Yes. It adds a lot of those adventures along the way. This is Mm -hmm. a two hour plus movie, and I definitely was feeling its length times for certain uh but it it puts those in because it is an adventure story after all there's a quest involved when you go on quests things happen Mm. during the quest so i'm happy that they were all there and then the interesting part to me was like you said when they get to the lord's house it's they have that exchange of like oh whatever you get from uh, you know, while you're resting here, you give to me. Like there was some of that. It wasn't mm-hmm. very, sh- it wasn't very strong. And Gawain was not very <laughs> giving in those moments. He kind of didn't do anything. And that's where the sash like was given back. Like he had the sash, then lost it, then got yeah. it back again. Also, which was interesting because in in the beginning of the movie, they set up that uh, the Green Knight is not a person. He's a he's created from the magic of his mother his mother basically right. uh is hinted at as either being morgan Le Fay or being someone who knows magic creates the green knight and it's sort of and she then after this meeting gives him a sash saying it will protect him and it's sort of kind of like i i love i read um someone named mesophy had basically said the green knight is a movie about being in your late 20s early 30s as you struggle to grow up and find the meaning in life in a world that's crumbling around you but also it's about your mother using dark magic to kick you out of the house or help you find a job (laughs) exactly (laughs) exactly because he was you know Gawain was not being very chivalrous he he was kind of overstaying his welcome at his mom's house was like okay Mm. time to get out of my house and and do your own thing and that became a part of this quest as well as to learn what it means to be chivalrous and to be sure, like to grow a noble into man it. yeah to grow into it so that was a interesting change that i appreciated because that gets to the whole point now you you get to again and they also think that the mom was like 
some of the characters in the Lord's house, right? He like mm. she was the the lady of the house and she was the older lady. You know, she brought mm. the sash back to him. You know, there's all that that is speculated that I'm not sure of. And am I mistaken or was the lady at the Lord's estate at the end was that the same actress as played the the girlfriend in the beginning of the movie Essel? yes so yeah. essel is this kind of new character at least to me mm. uh she's not mentioned i don't think in the original but uh he's basically sleeping around with this girl mm. uh and her name is essel and she loves him dearly and mm. he's just kind of like in it for fun and he has he ba- basically goes to this castle and he doesn't like recognize her it's clear that this is a different character but she's being played by the same actress who played essel and this is the lady of the house who keeps trying to seduce him essentially Hmm. and uh i i thought that was a really fun parallel to to have an actor play uh two roles that meant two different things almost because mm-hmm. you could argue that Essel was not keeping him back, but his uh, reluctance to marry her when she was declaring she was interested in being married to him. Uh, so he he's being seduced of, you know, I can still be a kid as long as I don't get married. And then all of a sudden there's the flip side. There's this lady of the house that is very much into me that I very much am attracted to. And it's the same, he sees at least the same person. Because this is essentially from his, uh, this story is from his viewpoint. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And this idea of chivalry with these two women plays an important part as well. Because this, this, this is, at the Lord's house, the sash comes into play because she returns it. And then there is this temptation, like you were describing from the original story mm. of like, Oh, it's not chivalrous to be fooling around with the with the lady of the manor, yeah. right? So, even though uh, he was being tempted, and he was given the sash, and the the sash is explained to have these properties of like, oh, as long as you wear it, you're protected. No one mm. can hurt you, and yeah. he clings on to that. And that's one of the things that I was mentioning earlier in the podcast was when he goes to face the Green Knight. He originally keeps it on he doesn't give it to the Mm -hmm. lord right which is yeah what he was supposed to do so not very chivalrous of him and then when he goes to the green knight and he's about to get his head chopped off we get this like what if scenario that goes through all of these things that he does you see him go back to you know camelot or whatever the round table and take over as king you see him do horrible things to his girlfriend like basically you know, ignore her and treat her like she was, you know, nothing. And well, I mean, I, I, let's go a little more into detail on that because I think it's really fascinating yeah. what they did. Because he not only goes back to the uh, round table, essentially, it, it's kind of implied like he lied. Yeah, no, I just survived. And he, throughout this whole time, he is like, he refuses to take off the sash it becomes his crutch. Right. And there's moments where it's like he, Essel, he has a child with Essel, but she's not uh, a true lady. She's uh, someone lower in the cast and he has to marry someone else. So instead of doing what would be chivalrous, he takes the child because it's his Mm -hmm. and then he marries uh, this vision in this vision, he marries Saint Winifred. He also he um, just story. gives her money, gives his girlfriend like money too, and takes the child and leaves her and never speaks to her again. You know, it was a very yeah, intense, exactly callous, non I mean, chivalrous the moment. The entire <laughs> vision he has of the future, mm. he doesn't smile. And at first, throughout the whole movie, you essentially have a tint of green or something very green prevalent within the frame. And after this moment of cowardice where he doesn't take off the sash and he runs from the Green Knight and we have this whole vision, he he no longer smiles. Mm-hmm. And it's very clear he is 
unhappy this entire... It, it, but he's sure of himself, but he's sure of himself through his cowardice to the point where we see through this whole montage, like, his his son dies in a battle. Uh, yeah. Gwyn, he marries Gwynvere. Gwynvere has a child with him. They The castle is sieged, and it's essentially, like, trying to link at, hey, because of him... Camelot falls yeah. uh, because of this one instance of cowardice that he's clung on to and let define him. And so uh, she runs away. And the final image of this vision is him pulling the sash out from underneath his robes, almost like he's pulling a dagger out. And then his head falls off, kind of giving off this idea and going back to the theme that the whole movie plays with of death and right. the inevitability of it right. and learning to accept that. Yeah. And he's like, I could die. That. And it's that, that moment where he's just like, he comes back to himself and tells the Green Knight, wait, before you actually swing your blow, I need to take off this sash. And it's because he's finally come to terms uh, that he's been battling with this whole movie about... Uh, Hey, I'm no longer a kid. I can't hold on to the indestructibility uh, mindset that I had while I was a teenager. I and also I need to be aware. Not only could I die at any time, mm -hmm. but if I'm not careful, I could die at any time, and it could not be a good or honorable death. Right, and I would rather. And but I do think though, what's interesting about this movie is he chooses to face certain death because. He, mm -hmm. he, he's like, wait, 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 wait. Because it's revealed that this whole what if scenario was a what if scenario and it cuts all the way back. It's a long montage. Mm -hmm. You see him go back and talk to King Arthur. And, it's, and it's like married. over 25 and, minutes. Yeah. It and it, it really is a montage. There's, I think the only words you hear throughout those 20 minutes are lyrics sung by a, a nursemaid helping mm, Essel deliver maybe. her child. It's it's really good performances. Oh yeah, because the nuance is there where you understand what's happening the whole way through. <laughs> oh yeah, you know this is very dramatic and dark tidings indeed, and mm. that and that Gawain is definitely kind of he's got this much more stern face on. He's very yeah. sto stoic and and grim. He becomes even more guarded than he was yes. in the beginning of the film, mm -hmm. it, because in the beginning of the film he's very vulnerable once he's at the court. First, he's like hanging out with all the knights, kind of like, you know, rubbing elbows, trying to like, I'm going to be a knight someday. And then the king would like to speak with you moment happens. And he goes in front of the king and the king's like, tell me, tell me about yourself. Tell me some tales. And he's like, I don't have any. Yeah. I'm not, yeah. I'm not worthy of anything you think I am. Yeah. And the king just being like, I know you're capable of it. And that's all that matters. But he's too stuck in his mindset of I'm not worthy I'm the kid sitting at the adults table. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. I thought that was really powerful to set up motifs for the rest of the film. Yeah. And it, it sets up again, this conscious choice that he has to make that shows that he has changed as a result of the quest, mm -hmm. because he finds himself to be at the beginning of this unworthy of chivalry. He's kind of, you know, avoided consequences and lived the easy life and coasted, uh, by living with mom and all this other stuff. And he's almost out of peer pressure and the desire to be worthy mm -hmm. of sitting at the round table, even challenge the Green Knight and go as far as to cut his head off. It wasn't like, hey, cut my head off. It was exactly. whatever wound you do to me, I get to do to you. And so he's like, okay, I fell you foul beast. Cha, cut his head off. It's like, okay. Exactly. And that's what's so fantastic about that because... He did the Green Knight, uh, like implies you could cut off my head, and he just takes that as the invitation of, okay, so I'm gonna do that, yeah. and it, it's a really great reversal because usually in a story, uh, especially old myths, mm -hmm. uh, one of the number one things you see is quick wit. Oh, you were so witty, you outwitted the Fey or yeah. whatever. Yeah, and in this one, him outwitting like. It's very clearly set up. The knights of the round table see him do this and are cheering. And throughout this whole decision process, you see uh, the king and queen just looking on with this stoic sadness because he made the uh, 
knightly heroic quick witted decision but not the wise one and it was it's and not like the chivalrous the one either exactly and the king is just like this you have signed your death warrant and while it was brave to do so mm. uh in in your need to prove yourself you have doomed yourself exactly and in doing the unchivalrous thing of this guy's like hey take a hit you go just to cut his head off, it is very extreme as well. But he thought he was being chivalrous because he didn't know. He's like, this is what heroes do. They cut things' heads off. <laughs> yeah. And then so now he's facing the consequences of that. And we get, again, we talked about how the ending of this movie is deliberately a departure from the original story because yeah. in the ending now, we come all the way to time to pay your dues. We saw the what-if scenario if he didn't and held on to the sash and was unchivalrous and did not wear his sash humbly so then he makes a decision wait wait stop stop i lied here's the sash and then the green knight's like nice job like you 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 did good and then it cuts to this ambiguous ending that is heavily implied that he gets his head cut off essentially well I, I actually want to disagree with that. So him, oh, yeah? he ba- the Green Knight comes up, lifts his head after he basically comes clean. I had a cheat. I'm I'm disregarding the cheat. Let the blow fall. And the N- Green Knight lifts his head, takes his finger across him, and says, "Off with your head." And that's essentially him saying the game is over. Mm. To me, that's how I read it. And it also ends so ambiguously. I think in a satisfying way because. What it's doing is it's like being clear to us. Uh, okay, so the so Gawain does get to go home, but the future's uncertain. But the one thing we can be certain about is he didn't make the mistake that would lead himself, his children, and Camelot into ruin. Mm. He's a better man now. Yes, that's that's kind of how I read that situation. It was he. It, it was a test. But it was a test to be overcome, not Mm. to fall to, if he did the right thing. And him doing the right thing was kind of him realizing, I'm not just doing the right thing for the sake of the right thing. I'm doing the right thing because I understand it will Mm. influence me as a person. And it would be better for me to be dead than to, uh, you know, run away because that will affect me. Right. Yeah. So it... That's that's kind of my take on it. Yeah, I mean, that's, again, I, I think that's the reason they left it to be ambiguous, because it kind of makes you think about these mm. different scenarios. And it's true that, yeah, it, it's possible. I just read it, I read into it, I was like, yeah, he was about to get his head cut off. And I think the fact that he was willing to choose that was his conscious decision again this like proof of this change of character that he was ready to do the chivalrous thing and also you know be responsible for his actions and do the noble you know do the right thing essentially this this idea of um going down this path of like accepting responsibility for your consequences it's part of growing up it's it's something that you have to do to become a man and then it to add chivalry into that brings into these like life or death scenarios yeah and to jump back Mm -hmm. real quick i mean with the theme of death him throwing away the sash is him literally throwing off uh the crutch that he's been working with of indestructible youth yeah he's finally coming to terms with his mortality to such a point where he physically has to remove it from himself. That's true. And is all the better for it. Like that that's why I took it as he isn't killed at the end of this. Also because it's set up this is a test by his mother. She can't con- she's not in full control. He could fail and die. Mm. But the Green Knight saw this as no, he passed the test. He that's lives. That's true. Cuz there is also these themes of uh you know Facing reality, escaping death, uh, things like that, which he's facing the realities of those things as well by giving up the sash. It's like you can't cheat death and live a good, honest life. Mm. You know, you can't, you can't, 
avo- escape reality and expect to be chivalrous and true. You know, so exactly. those are very fascinating themes that come to a head at the end of this when he's literally prepared to give up his life and by making the end ambiguous you can almost buy in that he really was accepting death in that moment he didn't get a pass we didn't see the pass happen and and it keeps Mm. you on that edge and i do think it's deliberate and i genuinely think if you ask the director you'd be like oh i don't know Mm. (laughs) you know it's (laughs) i want i feel like i read an interview somewhere where they had where he had filmed an ending where they did cut his head off Mm. and then didn't show it i want to say i read that i gotta check it out (laughs) an interview with the director i was reading in my research okay well while while we're doing that another point i wanted to go off of Mm. just you know him coasting uh and kind of living off of the kindness generosity of family bonds rather than actually trying to make something of himself that that you've been talking about one of the best moments to me is there's basically a scene it's implied he's hallucinating it's also kind of implied that this is where he takes a turn and goes into the fey world uh where he comes across a bunch of giants which really oh, yeah. harkens back to old Celtic mythology and uh, of just like, yeah, this land was originally the land of giants. And he r- runs towards them and basically shouts, begging, could a weary traveler ride upon your back to my destination? He's he's literally trying to hitch a ride off the back of giants mm-hmm. so he doesn't have to put in the work. Right, right. And and I the, forgot like, about that scene. If I'm yeah. being honest with you, I totally and, remember and that was a wild just, one. I, there's they were a cool hint looking. of his character growth there. It's not fully developed yet, but there's a hint of it because, mm. at least on a metaphorical level, because the giant actually does indulge him. The giant reaches out to pick him up, but when the giant does, he shies away. He he flinches away from it, and the giant backs backs away like, huh? And then it the, goes off walking again. And so it's this whole foreshadowing of him, like, finally, finally accepting that I need to do things myself. Yeah, that's true. Because there is that whole thing of being raised in a point of privilege and not having your own identity and the temptation to just continue to stand on the shoulders of these giants, right, and and ride that. And like you said, we start to see through his journey, because that was later in his journey as well that he um, got to, we see some lessons. I have the Lowry interview. It's from Vanity Fair. Uh, He said, this is a quote, I wanted to write an ending where his head gets chopped off, and that's a positive thing. That's a happy ending. He faces his fate bravely, and there's honor and integrity in that. But that doesn't mean that he's dead. He's killed. He received the blow that he was dealt, and all is set right within the universe of the film. And then he goes on to say, If people were to watch a movie in which Dev Patel gets beheaded at the end, they probably would like to leave the theater feeling differently than they do with the more ambiguous version. So... They like the idea of pulling meaning out of it by not being you. certain. So technically- at the same time, I I still stand by my my uh, viewpoint just because of the arguments had in the castle with the lord and lady about what the green Re- knight represents, which is both life, death, rot, cowardice, etc. Right. But um, at at the same time, it's it's very much all about honor mm-hmm. and all all about uh i mean it's the buzzword of the day chivalry oh yeah and hit him but one of the things that conversation they have uh kind of goes off to a tangent to is well are you actually going to die or should we see you again is it just the death of the current you when we see you again, you will be a different person. Mm. Will we embrace this new person or will we miss the old one? Mm. And which I think also is really great foreshadowing for not like saying what's going to happen during his vision, but really set you up to think about that during the vision that right. he has where right. everything goes wrong. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's the point of ending it on an ambiguous yeah. note. 
because there's so much to digest and draw from from this mm-hmm. movie and i think it all kind of circles around the the same things of going on this quest and going through these changes to be a more chivalrous honorable man and to know definitively is almost like to just narrow down the scope of what these themes are capable of delivering in this movie so i i, I you make a great case and i and who knows <laughs> also that you know lowry could probably just be telling vanity fair this and then he's like oh i was considering yeah. chopping his head off but it's like i was never gonna chop his head and off. Like, let's be real. art is in the eye of the beholder of course of course obviously. of course so yeah the green i know this might not be my place to say but definitely i'd love to read some of the twitter comments about this episode oh yeah and just see what other people who have seen the movie their interpretation is and just because i know there's room for a lot of interpretations at the end of the day yeah absolutely yeah i mean you gotta hop on uh, the twitter thread when we make the episode announcement that's the best place uh at roger roger oh wrong show at the fdf <laughs> podcast with a number of one at the end uh, that's our twitter handle so when we make the episode announcement that's where we'll probably talk a lot about the movie so definitely pop in and check that out because um yeah there's a lot to digest in this movie and i feel like joel you and i are like the only two people that have besides you know the people we went with our crew is the only one that the only people that have seen this movie and then the two <laughs> other people in the theater besides our party that were in the theater as well so uh, I think we're the only ones that have seen this film I've, no one's ever heard of it that I talk about so oh, uh, like, it's a shame we got to get more people to watch it yeah yeah I mean a24 I'm gonna show up usually for what they film <laughs> even though I'm not always like a fan and I have to digest it to appreciate it. I always am happy to watch it. I, I I like knowing that what I'm watching was is art. You know, I get that vibe when I watch this mm-hmm. movie that was like so carefully shot and crafted, and I appreciate that. And yeah, there's some things like I didn't like when they did the segments and they showed the subtitles. I'm like, what is that mm. all about? Like that's such like a indie movie I mean, it, thing it, to do that i'm like it it harkens back to the old like manuscripts the beginning of a manuscript where you've got the really oh, yeah. the first letter <laughs> is super well and fancy written and the rest of it's just kind of tight scribbles about it <laughs> yeah but if this was just very dry like the mm. beginning the lesson very much the it, child it kind of felt... wasn't on theme of anything it's yeah it to, it, it very much to me is like get broke rid of away at, at, um and uh, let's move it on to to somewhere else. But um, mm. yeah, it was fine though. It's such a nitpicky thing. I just thought it was odd. <laughs> and I've seen a thousand indie movies that do the same thing. And I was like, it just doesn't add to the experience of the movie to me. Mm. But whatever. It, it, I appreciated any plot that it was willing to tell me. I was appreciative for. I'm like, oh, okay, this is, <laughs> we're on the thing now. We're doing the thing. That's that's helpful to know. And but yeah, performances were great. Movie is stunning looking. And yeah, if you're a fan of art house movies, like this is a really polished one that I highly recommend. Oh yeah, gives you a lot of time for uh, relaxing the. I know we're kind of getting close to our wrap up, but mm-hmm. one one thing I want to talk about, yeah. I learned about this a while ago in film. Uh, in Japan, there is uh, something called ma, which is if I'm clapping my hands, it would be the sound in between the claps. It's that moment of si- it's the breath, like the anticipation uh, in between I- anticipation, but also sort of. A moment of reflection, mm-hmm. which can be both used for comedy, for drama, for anticipation, for mm-hmm. building horror. But it's it's a moment f- to give the audience a chance for reflection. And this this film really latches onto that and use it uses it as a tool. And, and if you if you pay attention to what you're feeling and thinking about during those moments. Because it's it has these long moments to let your mind almost wander. Don't be afraid of that and like think or be aware because every time we had those long drawn out moments, I was always reflecting on something different having to do with the overall story. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was really cool. So if you if if you're looking for like a way to go into this and you aren't sure, 
think about that. That might help you get through it a little more easily. Yeah. And I think just by managing expectations that this is not like a sword fighting movie will help. Yeah. Yeah go a long way as well i wish someone had prepared me for that a little bit more but i agree you make yeah joel you're making me want to watch it again <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I was like you know i don't know if i appreciated it enough the first time and now i need to see it again but yeah um super appreciate you know all your experience on the on the movie sets coming in to talk about this movie and your knowledge <laughs> of the lore of king arthur as well I, I wasn't expecting that so thank you so much for being so well read well uh you're, you're welcome. I mean, it, <laughs> I was just excited. I did a little bit of homework. I got to be honest. Yeah, well, um, but it, it paid off, man. Well, well done. <laughs> and now we have to figure out what movie we're gonna we're gonna see next. We saw Sang, Shang Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. That we did. Which, depending on how long Dylan's gonna be MIA for, we may have to talk about that next. <laughs> um, uh, and then we'll have to go see another movie at, at some point. But Well, I mean, it's always, uh, I think, now and forever, it's going to be a pleasure anytime I get to talk about movies <laughs> and an honor when I get to come on a podcast and talk about right. it with some cool people. Well, So, I mean, you just ring me up and I'll be back. <laughs> the I'll honor running. was all ours. I was like, I got to fill this date, but Dylan's not going to be here to record. And I was like, wait. I know a guy who's like super knowledgeable about movies that we went and saw a movie. It's a fantasy <laughs> movie. Like, let's make it happen. So super thrilled that you were able to come on, make it all work, share your experience, you know, because if it was just me and Dylan talking about a movie, we don't know what we're talking about. We're like, oh, this was good. <laughs> that was good. So to have your um, your professional experience to draw on was super um, appreciative. Anything else, uh, Joel, you'd like to say about either yourself or the movie before we wrap things up for the day? Well, if you'll give me just a second to plug, plug I, away. I'm uh, happy to be here. I've been, um, it, it's been such a pleasure getting to know you because I've uh -huh. finally had the opportunity to actually move up near you. And yes, I'm we're neighbors in Atlanta. now. Uh, yeah, exactly. And I'm now in Atlanta looking for gig work in film. So if you know anybody, hey, feel free to reach out to me. But um but besides that, I guess the final thing, final thought I have on this film is uh, the the going theme should uh, resonate with anyone. And it's just to finally uh, grow up and be wise <laughs> and to be kind. Mm. And so uh, I'll... I'll let my last words be that. Be kind. Be kind. Know you're doing the right thing, even if it's gonna hurt. Yeah, that's the, even if it yeah. kills you. But I don't know if we have to go that strong. But do your best to do the right thing, even if you have to make a few sacrifices to do it, because that is the noble, chivalrous thing to do. So, yes. Joel, thank you so much for coming on. It was lovely to have you. And we're looking forward, guys. We're, we're working on some stuff in the background. Hopefully, we'll get to show it off in the not-too-distant future. Joel's doing some great work behind the scenes. And until next time, guys, uh, go forth and conquer, friends. <laughs>